<laughs> Call the uh, <laughs> Thursday, February 23rd meeting of the Health and Human Services lady, Finance Committee to order. <laughs> Members, we uh, have yet right to uh, gather a quorum, but in the essence of time, I will uh, allow a Representative Hurtas to introduce himself and uh, provide some instructional on his house file 351. So, Representative Hurtas, welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members. Uh, thank you for hearing my bill. Uh, House File 351 is a bill uh, for Hennepin County. Um, I do, uh, Mr. Chair, have an amendment which we probably can't move until we get a quorum um, to get it in the proper order. But I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about Hennepin County. Um, as many of you know, HCMC, as uh, more well known, is really a, a, an asset not just for Hennepin County but for our region as a whole. In fact, uh, HCMC is a training center for 50% of all of Minnesota's physicians and they're uh, preparing uh, tomorrow's workforce with regard to that. It's also uh, operating the largest of, of only two critical burn units in our region. It's also home of the Minnesota Poison Control Center which is uh, used by the state in its entirety and even our bordering states. It has the uh, only 24-7 hyperbaric chamber available in our area. And it's also the backbone to emergency management system. But what's a little bit different about HCMC versus our traditional hospitals is that the normal uh, ratio uh, or mix of uh, revenue that comes into a hospital, usually about 25% of it is Medicare type uh, government reimbursements, 75% private pay, but in our more public hospitals, public institution, that mix dr dramatically changes. And so the revenue received is really kind of inverted where it's about 75% Medicare and Medicaid, about 25%. And so the, what this bill is seeking to do is to exempt HCMC from the 2% provider tax. And the reason for that is of course with a high mix of uh, of uh, public payments uh, which are already compromised in terms of a, a discounted reimbursement rate. Uh, that's what this is seeking to do. And uh, that's essentially it, Mr. Chair. Um, I would uh, have uh, a, Mr. Andy Mitchell, who is with the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, can uh, tell you just a little bit more about it. Mr. Mitchell, welcome to the committee. If you could uh, just announce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Andy Mitchell. I'm a senior uh, assistant Hennepin County attorney, and it's our pleasure to represent Hennepin County Medical Center. I'm here today to speak in support of House File 351. And uh, as mentioned, in essence, what this does is create an exemption from the provider tax for a very narrow category of payments, a category that, that we call supplemental payments. First, I'd like to provide a little description of the provider tax. All hospitals and healthcare providers in Minnesota are subject to a 2% tax on their gross revenues for patient services. Originally, uh, Medicaid payments were not subject to this tax. But in 2004, the legislature added Medicaid payments back into the mix so that we are subject to a 2% tax on patient services uh, for the provider tax. Mr. Mitchell, if I could just pause you and, and just clarify, this is for the supplemental payments only that you're exempting the 2%. Correct. Thank you. So uh, just a little bit about the Medicaid payments that HCMC receives. We receive two kinds of payments. For every Medicaid payment that, or every Medicaid patient we see, we submit a bill and we're paid for that. And the revenue from that service is taxed at 2%, no question about it. We also receive supplemental payments from the Medicaid system. And these are payments that are specific for the safety net hospitals, us and regions. And they are not, in our view, patient specific. They are calculated after, uh, by some very complex statutes that are part of the system, and they provide significant support to HCMC. It's only these supplemental payments that we are seeking to exempt from the provider tax. So should you move forward with this, we would be paying the provider tax 
on actual uh, receipts for patient services provided to Medicaid patients, we would not be paying the provider tax simply on the supplemental payments that come from the federal system. Excuse me. <clears throat> the reason we need the legislation is that HCMC has historically not paid the tax on the supplemental payments, but the Department of Revenue uh, issued an assessment a couple of years ago. We resolved our issue with them, um, but we certainly want to clarify this on a going forward basis. So this legislation is prospective only and would apply to receipts of supplemental payments uh, received after July 1 of 2016. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. And with that, uh, members, we do have a quorum. And so Representative uh, Zerwas uh, moves approval of the minutes for February 22nd. Any additions, corrections, or changes? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motions prevail and minutes are approved. Representative Hurtas, I will move House File 351 be re-referred to the Committee on Taxes. So you have the bill before you and before the committee and we will also uh, take up the A17-0066 uh, amendment. If you wish to speak to that, uh, go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the uh, A17-0066 amendment uh, simply modifies the very last lines of the bill and it removes the date. So it's just uh, very simple, page three, line eight, delete for services provided. <coughs> and uh, that's what, what has changed on it. I'll move the A17-0066 amendment. Uh, any discussion to the amendment members? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motions prevail and the amendment is adopted. So Representative Hurtas, we've heard some testimony already, but to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just recapping uh, the main points of this, uh, because of the provider reimbursement rate is already severely discounted uh, by the federal government, uh, this 2% tax on top of it uh, further exacerbates that reimbursement rate. Because the region is, uh, because the hospital is really a regional asset, um, I also personally feel that it shouldn't just become a Hennepin County liability, which uh, ends up on the taxpayers of Hennepin County. Thank you. Before we go to questions from the members, is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to the bill? Anyone in the audience? Hearing none, uh, we will move to questions from the members. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, first of all, I'm wondering, is there any federal interaction um, with this change? So is there any um, kind of federal matching of the 2% since uh, this is part of this, you know, I think you understand the question. Yeah, uh, I Mr. don't Mitchell. believe, oh, excuse me, Mr. Chair, um, I don't believe there is any need for federal uh, interaction on this. This is a tax of 2% on the funds after they're matched by the federal government. So um, I don't believe there's any federal issue here. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then also, I, I'm wondering about the fiscal impact. Now, I understand that this is going to the tax committee, but it's a, an impact on the health care access fund, I assume. And that is usually under the purview of this committee. And so I'm kind of uh, just wondering maybe, and this maybe is for Representative Hurtas, whether why there isn't any fiscal note on it. I, I know in the tax committee it's a revenue estimate. It's a little bit different. But still, I would think that this committee, since it is a fiscal committee, would want to know what the impact will be on the health care access fund. Do you have that information? Um, I did not request a fiscal note, but if you consider that about 75% of the hospital's revenues are this uh, category of reimbursement and you apply a 2% factor to that rate, it's a little more than a million dollars. And Representative Liebling, uh, this is a revenue estimate, and in order for it to be realized, it has to go to taxes before that's requested. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I see Mr. Berg is nodding his head, so he agrees with that. But, but yet, um, I guess that maybe maybe uh, Mr. Berg or somebody else could answer whether that approximate million dollar impact, to some understanding, is that. I'm Mr. just really looking for a ballpark because as we consider this, since this is a fiscal committee and this is uh, 
we deal with health and human services, I think it's pretty important for this committee to understand um, what we're talking about here in terms of uh, impacts. Mr. Berg, why don't you take a stab at that first and then I'll refer to the author. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I do not have the answer to that. I believe in testimony in front of the Reform Committee that Representative Hurtas had some idea. <laughs> Uh, Representative Hurd, I'll just intercede and, and maybe um, respond to the concern that Representative Leveling has. We can certainly request it back to this committee after it's heard in taxes if that is something that is needful. So we'll certainly keep that in mind. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would certainly request that we do that because it, it, would, it seems really strange to me for us to pass a bill out of this committee not knowing what the fiscal impact is when it impacts mm -hmm. directly on the funds under this committee's purview. So that would be that would be a great solution. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Representative Hurtos. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Liebling. I was just provided some information. 2018, the impact would be a little bit more than I stated, $2.1 million and 2.2 .2 in fiscal 19. Any follow-up, Representative Liebling? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I would still think that it would be a good idea to bring it back here. Um, so if, if the chair would uh, consider doing that, I, th I think that would be, I, I just don't remember us ever doing it quite this way before, but that's fine. I just think that we should, as a committee, see the real numbers. We'll Thank send you. that communication out of the tax chair. Representative Kurtos, any final comments on the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, thanks for listening and uh, hope you'll support the bill. Members, with that, I renew my motion that House File 351, as amended, be referred to the Committee on Taxes. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. The motion prevails, and House File 351, as amended, is re-referred. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Representative Zerwas, to your bill. Representative Zerwas, do you wish to move your bill? I do, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Zerwas, I'm going to move that House File 529 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. We do have the bill before us. To your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, House File 529 is a bill that we've worked on uh, in the past. It's the... Um, it's the targeted case management um, ITV bill uh, that we passed through this committee uh, previously. Um, all the stakeholders have worked uh, diligently with DHS uh, to resolve some concerns um, and try to manage the, um, the execution of, of the bill once it has passed. Uh, this bill came, that's me from Blue Earth County, and is strongly supported by uh, the Minnesota Inter County Association, the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators, and the Association of Minnesota Counties. Um, the bill would allow uh, for uh, video services or ITV uh, for certain cases uh, for case management to allow uh, video visits. Uh, if you have an individual um, that's in custody of the county that's being uh, uh, cared for and housed outside of the county, they can uh, meet their mandated visits uh, using uh, video visits. Um, it's similar to what we've done in the past uh, under some uh, telemedicine uh, provisions. The proposal will allow counties to be reimbursed for direct case management activities when using ITV. Um, Many human service clients are being served outside their county of financial uh, responsibility. Uh, Minnesota state statute and rules require case managers to meet with clients in person on a regular basis. Um, for example, Blue Earth County has clients that reside in St. Louis County or Blue Earth County case managers there are required to travel from Blue Earth County um, up to St. Louis County on a regular uh, basis for what oftentimes can become uh, a visit that lasts just a few minutes. Um, so it's hours of windshield time uh, for a few minute check-in. 
Uh, the use of technology could enhance service delivery and quality of contact, while at the same time significantly reducing costs for the counties uh, that provide those services. Last year, the counties worked with DHS and came up with language that's really limited in scope. Um, and so the, some of the requirements are the person receiving targeted case management services um, have to be in a setting that is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The ITV, the uh, case management, needs to be determined in the best interest of the patient uh, and deemed appropriate by the person's receiving, uh, the person's legal guardian, or the case management uh, provider in the county and the provider that's operating the setting where the person is residing. Of course, the client can refuse uh, these video visits at any time and request an in-person visit. And then, and this is important, ITV can only be used for up to, but not more than 50% of the minimum required face-to-face -face, uh, contacts. And so this does not in any way uh, set up to replace all uh, of the contacts uh, from the counties. And then this, of course, is still f um, contingent uh, and subject to federal approval and, and getting that federal waiver. Uh, with me today is Angela Youngerberg, uh, Director of Business Operations uh, for Blue Earth County, who can walk you through some of the process and uh, state uh, more eloquently the business case uh, and the need for this bill. Ms. Youngerberg, welcome to the committee. If you could just state your personal, your own name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Angela Youngerberg. I'm the Director of Business Operations from Blue Earth County Human Services. I am here representing the associations of MICA, MAXA, and AMC as well on this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to hear this bill. My story is years ago, um, one of the first jobs that I had was as a county case manager. And I, uh, I learned a lot in school about what it was to be a social worker and case manager. And they never told me that I would get to know the road system in Minnesota so well um, by driving all over the place to see people. And um, a lot of these individuals were, were people who were in facilities who were staffed 24 hours a day. And um, they were um, quite stable, but needed the ongoing case management services that are required and mandated um, by the county, <clears throat> or by the state to be provided by the county. And so some of these visits were lengthy and some of them were very short. And so in, in some instances, I would drive quite a long ways for a 20 minute meeting. And um, <clears throat> then I would get back in my car and go see another person um, somewhere else in the state. Now in my current role as a director in human services, I have the opportunity to see this practice from many different angles. Um, I can look at it in terms of quality assurance from a fiscal perspective, from what is to what could be, so how we could deliver case management services. And I also have the opportunity to hear from a lot of people who receive these services and help deliver these services. Um, the good news is case management is producing positive outcomes. The mission is well in hand and I believe that we do good work. Uh, the troubling news is that there's many advancements in technology that we've not been leveraging um, in some of our service delivery. While we do a lot of advancements with technology in terms of how we um, track what we do and um, with our documentation and data sharing, we've not really advanced how we deliver the service. And that's really what the heart of this bill is about. Um, <clears throat> we have many generations and especially our younger generation reminds us all the time that we need to use technology and we use technology to have relationships. Um, and we see this, we see this um, across society. So we're here today to ask for your support in this bill. It adds to, the per to a person's choice. It does not require anyone to use this service. If a person on the treatment team or their guardian or the individual or the case manager feel that it's not appropriate, uh, we would not conduct business in this way. Um, this adds options. And it's a place to start. We've worked with the Department of Human Services on this language and we recognize that this is pretty narrow, narrowly written. However, um, 
you know, I was asked recently, why, why wouldn't you expand this bill to cover all types of case management for all ages in all settings? And you know, um, while I'm generally a person that likes to jump in with both feet with a good idea and implement it and make it happen, I think this is changing how, um, to some degree, how we deliver the service. And it's important to go slowly and look for blind spots and, and look for things that um, we may not have seen. And so this is a really good population to start with and, um, and move it forward to potentially look at other populations in the future. County see this as a, as a cost savings as time efficient with no decrease in quality because we can actually conduct more visits by using this technology. Um, we are limited when we are required to go face to face. Um, and uh, Blue Earth County has a proven track record in using this technology. Um, we use it obviously not with case management because we can't use it with case management, but we do it with our psychiatric clinic. Um, and so delivering those psychiatric services, we provide two to 300 visits in this way per month. And um, our patients tell us that it does not decrease the quality uh, of service um, and is actually shown to improve our no-show rates. Um, and so the cost of this, there, there is a, a, s a small fiscal note on this, and it's really um, about upgrading the server or upgrading the, the computer systems that the state manages. And uh, in terms of implementing this, this would be a county cost if they want to offer this to their staff and to the individuals that they work with. And to give you an idea, it, it would cost us about $250 per unit to, to put this together. And um, it's the equivalent of what I pay one of my social workers to drive to Duluth to conduct one visit. So our return on investment is um, significant and quick. Um, small and rural counties, as I talk to, to my peers across the state, they're really dependent on this uh, happening and, and evolving our service. In closing, human services as a discipline really needs a technology platform from which to grow, and the state of Minnesota has, our, has the ability to do so with policy changes, and local counties can then reinvest their resources to make this happen. Other states are already using this video technology in ways that we are not. As a former case manager, I appreciate the core of case management services, which is helping Minnesota's most vulnerable people. But as a director, I see how this has shifted and changed over the years to be more clinically focused, more paperwork, and a little more red tape in terms of our service delivery, but really less innovation. And so this would spark that. Significant investments, as I said, are being made by the state by upgrading our computer systems, and this would really upgrade how we would deliver the service. So I urge you, to allow Minnesota to remain as a policy leader in the social service delivery system. And this is really a baby step. And so to take this, which is years overdue, I'd ask for your support with this bill. Um, thank you to Representative Zerwas for your leadership on improving the access to mental health care. And I sincerely um, thank you for your time and I'll stand for questions. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone in the audience that would uh, uh, wish to testify to this bill? Anyone in the audience? Hearing none, we'll move to questions from the members. Um, Representative Considine. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Are you new? Am I new? Yeah. Ms. Youngerberg. Uh, yeah. Oh. I, I, I've been with Blue Earth County for, well, since 2009. So I've, oh, I've been okay. around for a little while. You? Representative Considine. <laughs> thank you. I just, I hadn't run across you before. I actually have a meeting with Phil tomorrow. Um, at, at, oops. Uh, yeah, this is a great bill. Uh, it was actually one of the very first things uh, Bob and Phil grabbed hold of me, um, Bob being the county mm -hmm. administrator and stuff. And it just makes so much sense. And I was happy to sign on. I had my own bill, but Mr. Zerwas is so much more influential that uh, I was happy to be a co-op. Co <laughs> Thank you. Cut that video. <laughs> Representative Lunen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the testifier, was there an analysis done of uh, the number of hours this is expected to save? It, it, uh, it's obvious to see the the better use of time layout of this, and uh, you know, when you take a look at um, where this can be used and where it can't be used, have you calculated that out, Ms. Youngerberg? We have not calculated the number of hours. Part part of this is. Um, really looking at this as, as it's optional. And so um, in order to get an accurate representation of that, 
we would need to um, open that up to uh, many counties and case managers to determine really what the scope and what the extent is. Um, in Blue Earth County, I can say that on um, the, the adult mental health caseload, which is the, the primary rollout of where we would go with this first, um, there's about 20 individuals that we would target to use this with. And so, um, you know, I would say that the savings with just that small pop population would be in the hundreds of hours of time saved. Over what period of time? Over a year. I'm sorry. Over, over a year, it would be at least hundreds of hours. Follow up, Representative Lunen. Uh, thank you, the uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. The, so I, uh, the um, with that information, is there an expectation that there, there's uh, a potential for a reduction in required FTEs then for this? That we've got uh, 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 these people able, to, capable to take care of a lot more things? <laughs> Ms. Youngerberg. As a director in human services and just speaking just for Blue Earth County, I would say that I wouldn't look at this as a reduction in FTEs, but I, I could see that it could definitely help curb the request for more FTEs into the future. Our caseloads continue to grow as the service need um, grows as well. And so, you know, I really look at this as an efficiency to curb that trend. Representative Lunen. Final question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the I'm assuming there are areas in the state because of technology that this would not be viable as far as um, internet access or level of internet access. Would that be accurate? Ms. Youngerberg. Um, by and large, I think that this would be able to be available across the state. Now, I have not had a county come to me and say that this won't work because of the technology requirements. But I can say from experience, there is there is one group home that we have been working with um, on the psychiatric perspective, which is a little bit different system, but requires the same amount of um, uh, access to um, the technology. <coughs> And uh, we've been able to maneuver through some different ways of getting that access. It's not been as easy um, in, in that one case, but that has to do with, you know, if you were to take a look at a map and see where that um, coverage of that internet coverage is, they're kind of in this little tiny triangle between three different providers. And so um, I would say that their, their location was very, very remote um, and it, they would not, they're definitely not in the majority um, of facilities, I, I would, you know, um, anticipate that 95% or more of facilities would not have problems with us. Follow up, Representative. Oh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would do a, uh, a request for, uh, from the department, uh, they must have an analysis of um, if a caseworker is, is uh, working with someone, the number of hours they are spending uh, driving to them, windshield time was the term used on that. I'd be interested in seeing what that number is across the department for this specific issue, that if, if everyone took advantage of it, which isn't gonna happen, but to see what that, that top number would be, just to uh, realize what the percentage of utilization is. I think the how you're doing this is important the way you're doing it to go slow that if because this is important things are doing to make sure that it isn't a step back on the results we're getting and then if it does work creating a template a usable template that we can apply to other services so I I commend you on coming forward with this and I'm sure the staff uh, from the department that you're speaking of is in the audience and they'll be making sure they follow up with you representative Thank you. representative Haley Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your testimony. I'm curious as to the process it would take to get the federal waiver. How quickly can we implement this? Ms. Youngerberg. Um, I'm not personally knowledgeable about that process in getting the federal waiver. I know that we have spoken with the department and that that is you know, a number of months in terms of the process, but they um, have assured me that they're, they're well aware of what it would take and how that would happen. But I, I don't have the specifics on an exact timeline. Representative Haley. Um, one additional question. Can you give me an idea if this works well? And I, and I hope it does. I think it's uh, creative and it's these types of proposals we need to see in order to use our health care dollars more effectively. So what could be the next step? What additional services could this work for if this goes as planned? Ms. Youngerberg. So there's a couple of different ways that we could go with this as a next step. So right now this is adults living in uh, facilities with 24 hour care. We could, um, one logical next step would be to um, use this with adults in their home. 
um, where it's not 24 hour care. So we stay, stay consistent with that population in terms of the adults. And um, from, a, from a stepwise fashion with um, you know, knowing that there's probably more variability when it comes to the people side of the population than the facility or location. Um, that would probably be my recommendation that we continue with the adult population. However, um, a number of my peers um, would love to see this expanded in the realm of children's services. Um, number one, because children seem to be quite adept with uh, technology. Um, as well as we have some uh, children in facilities with 24 hour care now where we could do and utilize really daily consultation with the case manager instead of um, you know once a month visit that generally happens and so uh, I, I've been approached by people about what you know wh where would the next uh, step be and um, you know, it, it could take two very different tracks. I think there's a lot of, there's potentially more blind spots with the, in, um, the children's side of it, just like I said with the changing the population, but those would be two potential opportunities. Representative Zerwas to this point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Haley. Um, I think as we uh, look at what's all involved in, in getting the waiver, it's, it's my understanding um, that the waiver has been granted in other states um, and that's being done in other states and so it would be the department uh, putting in the request and I think the, the narrowing of services to start is I think an important part of getting that too. Representative Haley, any follow up? Um, to your uh, comment about using this for other services for children, I think we've heard testimony on other um, initiatives uh, with um, suicide prevention and other things that the, the population, the younger population does respond so much to technology and in some cases maybe even better than in a face-to-face. -face. Um, so if there's any possibility for um, pilot work in that area, um, I would support that. I think that's a, a very, um, an interesting area where maybe the outcomes could even be improved. Final comments, Representative Zerwas. Uh, thank oh, you, Mr. Excuse me. We have a question from Representative Considine. Uh, not a question, actually, but address that. I have another bill coming later on for law enforcement um, to also use ITV. There are a number of ways we can utilize this, but it's the same thing. They'll send a deputy up to Grand Marais or International Falls and they bring them back. It's a two day trip and they walk into court and they're released on their own recognizance. And the sheriff's department's not responsible for bringing them back. So they were, would walk into the jail and look at me and go, how do I get home? <laughs> well, yeah, so there are some other ways that we're looking at ITV this year. Thanks. Members, any other questions? Final comments, Representative Zerwas. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you, members. Um, I think it's a good bill that makes sense um, to best utilize our resources. Um, I want to take this time to thank uh, the department that's worked very closely uh, with, with the stakeholders uh, around this bill and trying to find language that people are comfortable with and feel uh, confident in being able to, to implement this and apply uh, for the waiver. Um, we got really close to getting this done uh, this year or last year and I'm hoping that we can get it done uh, this year. With that, House File 529 is laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Welcome to the committee, Representative Albright. Thank you. It's good to be here. Good that you show up. Representative Albright. I was told Albright. earlier today that I have to speak coherently and directly into the <laughs> microphone, so I'm just trying to make sure that I do my job as best I can. You just do your best. Representative Albright moves HF 743 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. We have and, the bill before us. And, and Mr. Chair, I do have uh, two amendments which I would prefer to take in their order. Put the bill in the shape that I would prefer it. 
All right, Representative Albright moves the A2 amendment. Representative Albright, to your amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the A2 amendment uh, specifically just talks about a change in the language to further define the difference between uh, the gradients of uh, or levels of education uh, incumbent upon uh, this bill. Any discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. And, and Mr. Chair, I'd move the A3 amendment. Representative Albright moves the A3 amendment. And Mr. Representative Albright, to your amendment. And Mr. Chair and members, uh, what this does is includes eligible dental therapy programs. It's become known to me uh, the import of this through uh, the course of uh, working on this bill and we're including that in the bill as well as uh, changing uh, lines one on line five and 15 of page two to uh, change that for pharmacists as well as advanced dental therapists. All right, Representative Albright. Any uh, discussion members? All right, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Representative Albright, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I will be brief. Uh, uh, what this uh, bill does, House File 743 is established as a grant program for eligible healthcare professional sites, commonly referred to as clinical training sites. With the amendments that we have just adjoined to the bill, it makes it more robust and comprehensive. Uh, for the purposes of uh, the dentistry industry, as well as making some technical changes to the language. Minnesota healthcare workforce shortages have been well documented in previous presentations uh, to this committee, as well as others. The Legislative Healthcare Workforce Commission report in 2015 identified workforce shortages and resented solutions, which you supported by expanding physician residency and loan forgiveness opportunities. Clinical sites and related training are essential to train the Minnesota healthcare workforce. That is without a question. Clinical hours are a requirement for licensing and provide real life experiences in patient care under the supervision of a licensed professional. House File 743 creates a program, a grant program, to expand clinical training facilities and sites for physician assistants, advanced practice registered nurses, mental health professionals, and now as amended, the dental professional. The Workforce Commission received testimony from both students and training institutions and learned uh, to a great degree of the challenges in providing the training sites needed to develop the skills required to begin practice. This lack of clinical training sites has led to a delay in graduation for some students. Minnesota needs a strong health care workforce. The grant opportunities in this bill will begin to address the need for additional clinical sites by providing support to the 10 to 15 programs each year. I have uh, testifiers in the audience that are able to answer questions on the technical nature of this bill, uh, if so desired, Mr. Chair, but I will leave my comments at that and uh, be available for questions. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to uh, testify on this bill? All right. Seeing none, members, if you have any questions. I think he was correct. Any final comments, Representative? Seeing none. <laughs> <laughs> First, a few words. Oh, thank you for bailing me out, Representative. <laughs> Representative Haley, you have a question. Oh. <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and thank you for your testimony and your bill. Um, I'm, I'm curious, just because I don't have a, when you say clinical sites, is this additional programs at our um, universities or this is where they're actually doing their um, their practice work? So we're providing money to the actual healthcare institution where they're doing their practice work. Can you clarify? Representative Albright. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Holly, this is actually at the site where they are practicing their trade and craft and, and perfecting their craft. Representative, follow-up question? Yeah, I'll let it go. <laughs> All right. Mm 
Any other questions? All right. Saying none, HF743 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. Members, our next meeting is Tuesday, member, or, uh, February 28th. Skipping that. Okay. Starting next week, we will have a number of bills on our agenda. Please try to be there at the start of committee. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>